worship today. Um, for those of you on site, it's great to see you here, and I, I'm assuming you're feeling a bit better on your um, bottom now that you know the pads are in the queue. Um, I missed those last week being away, so it's exciting to come back and see those in place here. Those of you online, I hope you're equally as comfortable in whatever setting that you happen to be with us in today. So a lot of things happened while I was gone. I mean, few cushions came. The Olympics started, the UCC sold their building, the, uh, the, the wa uh, Washington Street is open. Um, yeah, Peace UCC voted to sell its building last year. So all these wonderful things can happen when I'm gone. But um, seriously, the building, the council had been dealing with that since March um, and dealt well with that issue and brought a proposal, but I just want to clarify, since there's some of you, you're just learning about this now, particularly those of you on the Presbyterian side, but I want to assure you that this will not change how we are MCM. The sale of the building to Lakeshore Family Funeral Homes comes with the promise that the church will be able to continue to be the church as it is now, free of charge, um, for at least 10 years with the renewability of that um, at 10-year at increments. So don't worry, we'll still be doing everything the same. Um, it's just that it frees up um, dollars on Peace UCC side to continue to better invest in our mission and our outreach program in the community. So thank you to um, the congregation of for being thoughtful to think ahead and think about what is ministry versus building. I know it's not easy, but it might be fair to say that um, we can have our cake and so, um, so we celebrate that presence. My week and my family's week at the, I believe it was the 6th, 7th annual um, Synod School for the Presbyterian Synod of Lakes and Trails. It's a gathering of a regional body of five states. Um, was a wonderful time. Um, based on some work that the UCC conference did a few years back, I taught a course called Shift Happens. Um, and as we look at the shifts in ministry from when some of us were confirmed or ordained or entered leadership versus some of the things that are in the life of church now, things that we have talked about a lot, but it was a great time for discussion, but also just a great time to be away um, with about 450 of our other best friends and extended family. So as always, thank you you for the privilege of serving in a congregation that allows things like that to happen. Because when I'm leaving, I serve you better. So thank you. A couple um, official or technical announcements that we want to be able to share with you. Um, just remembering um, our worship schedule, because last month was different, and we worship the entire month here. So we're here the first two weeks, so this Sunday and next Sunday. And then on the 15th and the 22nd, we're back to our schedule where we're worshiping at First Presbyterian. And then the last Sunday of the month, the fifth Sunday of the month, the 29th, we will be worshiping at Union Park and we'll be celebrating the 130th anniversary of St. John's United Church of Christ. So you'll be reading more about that. I mean, we've done that in past. Um, we also, we have the time capsule. Um, from Saint, from the building of St. John's that we will open up and share and we'll, we have some, uh, we're inviting some of the former pastors of course, to the table um, to be able to come back as we celebrate that history of St. John's as part of what makes us the Manitowoc Cooperative Ministry. So remember those things. We continue to serve our community dinners. Um, and uh, we are always looking for you to come and eat. And if there's different ways that you want to help, 
um, to prepare some food, to help box it up, um, to help um, clean up a little bit. Those things are perfectly welcome. Uh, we would invite all of you to participate in that. Are there other announcements in our life and ministry together that we want to share at this time? I'll share one other thing. Last week, um, Franz, uh, Franz Rieger, Mr. The conference minister for the Wisconsin Conference of um, and shared with you. Um, and he just texted me afterwards and just said that you all are great, um, that there was certainly a great spirit um, here as we worship. So, um, so other people see how wonderful you are. So let that be in you as we worship. So let us join together in our gathering time, please rise in body or spirit. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. And all the time. Let us pray. Connecting God. You who have woven us together with all of creation, open our eyes to see that we cannot survive in isolation, so that we might be motivated now to turn toward the other, see you in them. For the work of wholeness is in all of creation. We praise you as the healer of all who are hurt, the repairer of all brokenness. And let all of God's people say, Amen. Let us join in singing the hymn, Sing of Color. A colores. done, please be Please join 
me in prayer as we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed. Almighty God, through your only Son, you overcame death and you opened to us the light of eternity. Enlighten our minds and kindle our hearts with the presence of your Spirit, that we may hear your words of comfort and challenge in the reading of the Scripture, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So our reading today comes from the first letter of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Some of these words will be very familiar to you. And I hope that even if the particular words aren't familiar to you, this idea that God is love will indeed be familiar to you. So listen now as Paul writes, or as John is writing to church. Dear friends, let's love each other. Because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love does not know God, because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only Son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we love God but that God loved us and sent the Son as a sacrifice that deals with our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us this way, we also ought to love each other. For no one has ever seen God. If we love each other, God remains in us, and God's love is made perfect in us. This is how we remain in God and God remains in us, because God has given us a measure of the divine spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If any of us confess that Jesus is God's Son, God remains in us, and we remain in God. We have known and we have believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who remain in love remain in God, and God remains in them. This is how love has been perfected in us, so that we can have confidence on the judgment day. Because we are exactly the same as God is in this world. There is no fear in love. For perfect love drives out fear. Because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid has not been made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. And those who say, I love God, and then hate their brothers and sisters are liars. After all, those who don't love their brothers or sisters whom they have seen can hardly love God whom they have not seen. This commandment we have from God. Those who claim to love God ought to love their siblings also. Friends, this is the love of God. Amen. Miss Brittany had her water heater sprung a leak and she has a flood in her basement today. But um, I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you want to come up by yourself? Okay, I understand that. I don't think anyone else would want to just come up all by themselves. So guess what? You get to serve. So this, this little card with a beaver holding a balloon um, was given to me by a friend who, you know, a friend took the time to make this cute little thing. And, you know, it, it may be simple to you, but it's, you know, it, it's special. You know, maybe you've made something a gift for somebody before. Maybe as simple as a little drawing on a card or on the envelope, or maybe something, you know, some of the beautiful quilts that the group makes. 
Maybe, you know, you, you've gone out of your way and you've really put your heart and soul into making a gift. Now, what do you think when someone does this to it? How does that make you feel? How do you feel? Yeah, you're upset, aren't you? You put your lifeblood into that. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it hurt. I saw your face, some of you, your face, because how could somebody do that? Well, now I want you to think for a minute. God has created this incredible world. And sometimes all we've done is rip it apart. God has created us as wonderful, blessed human beings. And sometimes all we've done is rip it apart. Imagine how God feels. Felt that same. So today, as we focus on God's love and healing relationships that can come from that, I want us to remember that God has first loved us. And not us, not only us, but all of us. And so we ought to embrace love and respect Holy and gracious God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us a world that we can cherish. Thank you for all the gifts that you bring into our lives. Help us to honor you by honoring your gifts as well. Thank you. Now, I hope you don't say that's the best sermon you've heard today. But I'm still okay if it is. So recently, through that wonderful medium of Facebook, um, I was kind of drawn into some conversations, and you don't need to go to my Facebook page to try to find it out. But um, there were things that were basically said that uh, to me, not by me. Clear. Well, you're just going to go to hell and you're Comments of great hatred, in part because I serve you, um, and because the denominations that we embrace, the United Church of Christ and the Presbyterian Church USA, have tried to live into these words from 1 John 4 about loving all people. Well, and apparently is so that not all people want to love all other people. Unfortunately, some Christians don't think we ought to really be loving one another. When I hear comments like that, and I wish that that was the only time that my family has ever heard. It's no surprise to me that my daughter wanted to leave Manitowoc as quickly as she could when she graduated. Why would you want to be in a community that has called you names, has ridiculed you, and has said that you're going to It's Not you, she was running. But I can understand why a lot of people don't always like to stay around in communities where voices of hate seem to be so loud, even if they're a small minority. It's no surprise to me that some people turn to things like drug and alcohol as a way to numb all these things that they hear, this negativity. It's no surprise to me that for some, suicide is an answer that allows them to escape horrible. It doesn't seem to be what John tells us 
in this letter about love and about what it means to walk with a God who we're told doesn't simply love, but is love. God doesn't choose to say that I'll love somebody. God simply is love and cannot help but love. Fortunately, you and I, though created in love, though created and blessed, we humans have the ability to choose not to love. And in doing so, we often hurt God's creation. But I have two stories that I want to tell about our congregation that show that we do understand. And those of you, well, all of you, might know who these individuals are, and you can hide things only so much and still talk about our people. I have permission as much as I could to tell this story from one person. They're no longer living, and I can't get that permission. But even if you know these people, I ask you not to turn this gossip opportunity but let it be the opportunity to share the love and understand how the love of a community of faith helps transform them. So a number of years ago, a person showed up at First Presbyterian Church. They came late and left early to worship for about two weeks, which means that I don't really have any opportunity to interact with them, and other than a few people maybe nodding at them when they come in after the service started and leave before it ends, no one really has a chance to interact with them. And that's usually a sign that that person isn't ready to have a lot of interaction, but they also know that they want to be. So, I mean, when someone comes late and leaves her life. But then the third time, and I can't remember if these were sequential, but the third time this person came, they came before the worship started and sat in the pew. This was a big person, bigger than me, taller than me, wider. And because, like in most of our congregation, people we don't know stick out real well. This person silently wept, and I was able to go up to them after, or before the service started, and, and they shared a few things, and I said, let's talk afterward. One of the, the hard things about right before worship is never a great time for a pastor to get into. I said, I hope you'll stay and then talk. And this person did. And afterwards, we sat in the, in the hall and we chatted. And, and this person told me about their family life, which wasn't all that good. This person had a disability and was receiving disability payments. But the mother and the brother took those payments them for whatever they want. And so he could never really seem to get ahead in anything that they did. They were always needing get stuff to get an allowance even at 30 years old in order just to be able to have lunch. Even though this money was supposed to be for them, they never really got to see the doctor like they needed to, to explore what things may be going on that modern medicine helped. And this person was just at wit's end. They couldn't make it anymore. And it just happened to be that First Presbyterian was in the neighborhood of where they lived they just happened to stumble in. It could have been any church, but it happened to be First Presbyterian. 
Even in that brief time, we developed some potential action plans on things that this person could begin to do before they could get anywhere with the state about changing anything. They had to have a copy of their birth certificate because they couldn't get an ID, a state ID, without a birth certificate. And mom claimed that she didn't have one. So he didn't have any state-issued ID, and that meant that he couldn't advocate for himself because in the system, he didn't really exist. He couldn't prove who he was. It's just the way things are. But then he came back the next Sunday, and they were wearing a quite colorful sundress. Also, an unshaven face. It wasn't the thing that good Presbyterians typically saw in their churches. People didn't know what to think of a large male wearing a sundress and coming to worship. But I didn't see anybody do anything negative. I knew there were a lot of people, because I got a lot of whispers at the end of the What's going on? Who is that? But those were inquisitive, not condemnation. At Bible study on Monday, that was a topic of discussion for some. But before Bible study came, one of, and I'm going to use this, um, and don't, uh, one of the sweet old ladies of the church, and don't ask me to define her old lady, but um, at came in and said, you know, what was going on with that? And I said, I don't really know. And this member said, well, I don't know either, but you know what? Afterwards, I just walked up and I just said, I don't know what you're going through, but I hope you know that we love you. You're welcome. I think I cried. Help me out loud. You know. And that person continued to be a part of the life of First Presbyterian Church eventually joining the church and giving their testimony of faith and eventually being ordained as a deacon, finding a niche where they could help out. And the church loved them through all of it. The person now lives in two rivers, and unfortunately, Sundays is not always a time, so there are no buses. Things, but is very much connected still through prayers and other behind the scenes way of being involved, even though we don't always see them. Love. That person's life has changed. They live on their own now, they have their own apartment, they manage their own money. All because a church said, you may not understand, you may not know what's going on, but we're glad you're here. We're I think that's part of what 1 John is trying to tell us about loving one another. There was another person who came here to peace. And when we first met her, she was pleasant and connected and wanted to share her gifts of music and things and eventually joined the church and everyone just seemed to embrace her. And, you know, everybody has, I'll call them eccentricities, right? Everybody has some odd little things about the but we love them anyway, right? 
Sometimes we love them because of those things that make them. But I certainly know you love me by all my answers. And she came, and as the time, as it went longer, she became more needy from the congregation. Needing rides, needing help getting her medication, help with some basic things in life. She didn't seem to be able to really pull down a job. And the congregation just kept loving her, let her share her gift of music and some songs she wrote here in worship on an occasion or two. She sang with the choir when she was able, but usually that type of a commitment to her was And then things started to change for her a little bit. We all noticed a change in her behavior and her personality. And we learned that she had stopped taking some of her medication. And those medications are meds that help even her keel. And when she wasn't on them, she was sometimes seeing the world around her different way. Mental health is just as bad an illness as any other physical thing. But yet the congregation kept loving her. She would call folks for rides and for financial assistance and we still kept loving her and we talked about her pastorally when needed in small groups to make sure that no one was being taken advantage of. Pastor Judine and I and other members of the church helped her clean out her house, helped get her physical and psychiatric care. And then one day she decided that she wrote a letter and told Pastor Janine that it was a sin that had been the past. Clearly this wasn't the person that had been worshiping for a while. Their mind had changed. And then a few weeks later it came that we weren't a real church because we were too welcoming And so she set off to find another church. And we loved her still. She still reached out in different ways to individuals. No one said, well, you're not a part of us anymore. We don't want you around. She still helped in ways that we could. And, and then one day I saw her at the farmer's market and Something had changed again, and now everything was beautiful and wonderful, and she wondered if the church would ever take her back after she had said some horrible things. Of course. And she came back, and she worshipped for a brief time. And then, as all too often, the cycle of mental health caught up to her again. And eventually, the members of peace who lived near her checked in on her one day and found that she had passed away. It's a sad ending, but the point of the story is, is that this congregation continued to love her. Even though she was a difficult person to love. And she created that difficultness on her own. But yet, you kept loving her. And even when she said hurtful things, 
about our pastor and who we were as a congregation. He kept loving her. I think that's something about what 1 John chapter 4 wants us to understand. We don't always need to understand people's backstories. We don't always need to understand where they're coming from. But we are called to love. Love isn't an intellectual thing that requires book learning and school degrees. Loving, I think, is something that is in our DNA. Even though we can choose not to love, I believe that at that moment of creation, when God breathed life into a lump of clay, Part of what was past in that was the divine love. And it may be hidden. It may be hidden under years and decades of muck and mud. It may be hidden under the calluses that have grown because too many people have told us somehow we're not right that we're not good enough, that we're unlovable, that we're undesirable. And we've just thickened our skin and we've hardened our hearts because that seems to be the only way we can get through this world. But underneath all of that, is that divine gift wrapped God's love, which fills us. Imagine that you're living in the midst of darkness and always have. You've heard these rumors that there's this thing called light, but you've never seen it or felt it. You're stuck. You don't know which way to go. It's frightening and it's scary. And you hear some footsteps. And you cry out, do you know how to get out of here? And they say, yes, I do, but I don't have the time to show you anything. I don't have the time to help you. I'll tell you what, I can give you a hundred bucks. But I can't help you, I have to go on my way. And you say, what is a hundred dollars going to get me? What am I going to supposed to do, call an Uber? I don't even know where to tell them to go. Money doesn't help. And then you hear some more footsteps, and you cry out, who's there? And this time it's the voice of a woman. And you say, can you help me out of this darkness? And she replies, well, have you ever thought about maybe it's your own fault that you're stuck in here? Why didn't you just give your life over to Jesus? And you cry out, look, I have money, I'll pay you, just help me. I know about Jesus, but I need help right now. And all I've ever heard about Jesus is that Jesus helps me when I'm in the light, and I can't get to the light, I can't get to Jesus, I can't get the help that I need. Won't you lead me out? She turns and she leaves. And you cry after her, just give me some hope, please. And then another comes by, and you say, can you help me out of here? I have money. I'll do whatever you say. Just help me out of this darkness. And the voice simply says, come and stand next to me and walk. I don't need your money. I don't need you to have, you know, to pledge your allegiance. I don't need you to believe anything about me. Just come and walk beside me. And I can lead you out. And so they do. And then you're there, and suddenly like the opening to a cave, the light here. 
And it's not just something you see, but it's something you feel, like on a hot summer day. You can feel without seeing when the clouds pass in front of the sun. You can feel the light. You can see the light. And it is amazing. And you turn around to thank this person. And you see that they're walking back into the darkness. And they said, where are you going? They said, I'm going back in. There are more like me. They too need the light. And I choose to go into the darkness. Bring them into the light. And they say, you too can come back if you want. Now that you know the way, you too can choose to come back into the darkness and to bring others to the light. I wonder, friends, if you and I are willing to go back into the darkness so that others might see the light? Are we willing to go back into the darkness and to bring into the light the sacred truth? We are all God's beloved children. Will we go into the darkness of the world and bring the light of truth that we are all in relationship with one another. And that only in building new relationships can the light be fully experienced. Remember, it's not just a thing of sight. It's a thing we feel. Are we willing to go into the darkness and let all people know that the light is for them as well. It's not just for white men who own property like our original Constitution. It's not just for those who have accepted Jesus Christ. For Jesus himself said there are many sheep. And I go to it's not just for those who are like the majority. For Jesus chose to spend most of his time with those who the world calls sinners and outcasts and marginalized. In fact, Jesus lifted up those individuals as models and examples of faith. Certainly not just those who have the same color of skin. Jesus was closer to African American black than you and I. Born in Africa. Middle Eastern. Certainly, we're not supposed to just love those. Will we go into the darkness and tell the brokenhearted and the disparaging and the hopeless that there is light for them? Will we go into the darkness to tell the poor and the rich that there is something more than possession that can give you life? Are we willing to go to those who choose to embrace how they were created? Those who love differently than us and say, you are us, and you too are the body of Christ. Will we go into the darkness that this world has created and in some dramatic Wizard of Oz moment, be willing to tear back the curtain and let the light hidden for so long shine forth. 
Friends, in many ways, you and I live in the light. That's the easy part. The challenge is will we go back into the darkness and to build these healing relationships with people and with creation so that God's original love and grace will be able to emerge that all will know that God is love. Amen. Let us come and join together in singing We Are One in the Spirit, reminding ourselves that the world will know that we are Christians and we can replace that perhaps with they will know we are weird and we are marginalized and we are not like everybody else because we choose to love. Please stand and body your spirit and let us sing together.
and so with all creatures of the earth and heavenly beings, with all that croak and sing, howl and yip, purr and squeak, we lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving here. Gathered here, we give praise and thanks to you. Gathered here, we lift our voices. Gathered here in the glory of your love. Hosanna now. Creative God, you came to us in human form to breathe your own air in lungs, to feel your own dirt underfoot, to drink your own water for the quenching of holy thirst. You walked, you talked, you taught, and you loved among us. And we needed you, a mirror for our souls. We needed to see love in action. And so you came to us, O oh Lord. Jesus invited us to true communion with you and with each other, stranger and friend, loved and unlovable, insider and outsider. Through the gifts of the earth that sustain us, you give us life. You broke open our hearts and you challenged us to be your beloved children. It is our birthright, you reminded us, our nature to call forth beauty and compassion in this world. For we are your image, capable of deep and abiding love, not just self-preservation. We ask you to infuse your church, your body, this ministry with the peace and the passion that is ours to offer. And so now, O oh Lord, we offer to you the prayers that are among us now. Hear us as we speak out prayers that are upon our hearts and minds for you and for us as a community to hear. We pray for continued healing for Jan Cryo and for Tony Casey. We pray for Melanie's sister, Jolene, who had brain surgery this past week. Though the pain is great, she is at home, but continues to need our prayers. And so we lift up Jolene and Melanie and all their extended family, oh Lord. We pray for brokenness you may bring healing. We pray for our nation. And we pray for those who said we are unlovable. We pray for those who have told us we're going to hell. We pray for those who don't see the world the way we see. Pray for those and for us that we might capture your love. And so, O oh Lord, like fresh rain in a drought, like sunshine breaking through the clouds, like morning dew after a long night, pour out your spirit upon us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the manna we need to feed a hungry world and the salve we need to heal a hurting planet. Challenge us, Holy Spirit. Nudge us to reach out to touch your holiness in all things and be changed by our encounters. And so, O oh Lord, we pray this in the name of your holy, dancing, three-in-one, creator, redeemer, sustainer of all. And we say together, gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power. Spirit draws near. Friends, let us pray together our family prayer, using whichever version is for your spirit and prayer life. 
Our Father, Mother in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Friends, when Christ was at supper with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. After the supper, he took a cup, he poured into it, he said, Take, drink, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever we drink of one cup, we eat of one loaf, whether we're gathered in person or whether we're spread across the face of God's creation, we are unified. We are one. We are God's people, called to receive and to give love. And so, friends, these are the gifts of love. Let us come and let us share our gifts with God's presence in the church, and let us receive these good gifts today. As we receive these gifts, I call forth members of this congregation to share and to love, as God has called us all. Harry and Maya, would you like to come forward and to share these gifts with those? Rick Herman, would you like to come forward and to share gifts? Lucy, would you like to come forward and to share? Just stand right here. Lucy, would you like to go to the back? All has been made ready, friends. You share your gifts in the plate. Come and take this bread and cup. Take it back to the seat, peel a top layer, and there'll be a thin wafer. Peel back again, and there's a cup with the <coughs> juice in there. These are God's gifts for the people of God. Come, let us feast together. Thank you. 
and most loving God, as you have given us your very gift, your very self of love, let us go out into the world knowing that the more we share, the more love we have. Let us give freely of what you have given us until that day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of all you our Lord of Lord, the Prince of Peace. You are love. Amen. If we stand in body or spirit, let us go out singing. Go now in Let us go out in love. Amen. And I'll